Thanks, and uh, let me add my thanks to uh, JJ and the other organizers uh, for this wonderful conference and for giving me the opportunity to speak. So today I'm going to be telling you about this recent work from October that I did with Jan Plafke and Jan Steinhoff at uh, Humboldt University in AEI. And it's fortunate that I'm going right after Gregor because I'm going to be picking up on a, a very similar theme to what he was just talking about with this uh, these world line approaches to uh, study uh, classical black hole scattering. What I'm going to do is a little bit different though. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be taking this, these world line approaches and I'm going to be comparing them with the sorts of approaches that many other people have been talking about, where we think about uh, scattering amplitudes from a more conventional Q QFT point of view or the S matrix. And I'm going to be showing you how we can build in some sense a theoretical link between these different ways of thinking about uh, these observables. Because of course we know we can get to the same observables at the end of the day. So to start this off, let me just begin by remarking that the question that we're really trying to answer here is not a new question. In some sense, it's a very, very old question. What we're really trying to understand is the link between uh, multi-particle QFT and single particle quantum mechanics, which is of course a very old question, almost as old as quantum field theory itself. So in order to help me understand that, let me start by thinking about this very basic scenario where we just have a massive complex scalar phi uh, interacting with gravity. And just for fun, let me show, throw in this coupling to the Ricci scalar as well. Now, the key, uh, um, the key thing which I'm going to be interested in here is this uh, so-called dressed propagator for the scalar. So this is not the normal you know, trivial scalar propagator, one over p squared minus m squared. This is the dress propagator. So what we do is we think of the gravitational field um, as some uh, fixed background, which this propagator exists in the presence of. And what we do is we take our uh, scalar propagator and you can visualize it just like this, as you know, your scalar moving along and it interacts with the background h in terms of these vertices right here in the weak field approximation. And this thing is going to turn out to be very powerful because it turns out that this gravitationally dressed means function has a world line path integral representation. Now you can do exactly the same thing for scalar QED, by the way, and the equivalent answer for scalar QED, I think, goes all the way back to Feynman. In the case of gravity, it's a bit more recent. It goes back to the 80s. It's work by DeWitt, Beckenstein, and Parker. And you can write the answer as a path integral. So this path integral right here, this is just the normal path integral that you're used to from quantum mechanics. We integrate from some point x to some point x prime for the propagator. We also, of course, have to integrate over the finite uh, time interval over which this propagator is taken. And finally, this, uh, what we see here inside the action, sorry, inside the exponential rather, is precisely the action which Gregor was just showing us in his talk, which he was using in order to describe uh, the world line theory. We also have this coupling to the Ricci scalar, but we're actually not going to have to worry about this too much because what we'll see is that it becomes suppressed as soon as we take the classical limit, or we can just set xi equals to, to one quarter and kill it right here. So hopefully what you can already see is the utility of this, because now we have a link between, you know, QFT, scalar on the one side, which we can use to talk about amplitudes, and world line on the other side. And this is going to be our basic building block. So in order to make use of it, what we now want to do, want to do is to transition to thinking about um, S matrices. So I have to confess something to begin with. The propagator I showed you on the last slide is actually not quite complete. Um, the full propagator, which uh, Beckenstein and Parker wrote down, it also contains these non-propagating Li Yang ghosts. So A is a commuting field and B and C are anti-commuting. I'm not going to say too much about these because they're actually not that important for what we're going to do, but you have to include them in the world line in order to control certain divergences when the two world lines coincide with each other. From our point of view, the really interesting thing, though, is, of course, as with any propagator, we can think of it as a two-point function. So just a pair of scalars, phi and phi dagger, sandwiched inside this exponential where SI is the scalar action that I showed you on the last slide. So now if we just go back to, you know, our most basic definition of what an S matrix is, where we start from a time-ordered correlator, of course, we take our time-ordered correlator, we write it out in the path integral prescription. So we've got an integral over H mu nu and our pair of scalars. And then, quite literally, we just perform this uh, path integral. And you see that 
the, the fact that we now have this dressed propagator where we also have the gravitational field as a fixed background is what enables us to take that fit, that um, path integral. And so what happens then is we get rid of these uh, scalar actions. And you can hopefully see now that we're in a really good place because if you look at the expression for the propagator, we've replaced the integral over the scalars with an integral over the positions of the black holes and also these ghosts. And the scalar actions have now been replaced with world line action. Unfortunately, this isn't quite the end of the story though because um, of course we don't wanna look at time element correlators. What we wanna look at are S matrices. So there's another step. We need to uh, apply the LSZ reduction formula. So what that means in practice is we need to take the Fourier transform and then we need to cut the external legs, in other words, send our states out to the boundary. And that's related to the fact that this action here is over a finite time interval, whereas the action that Gregor was talking about, of course, was over an infinite uh, time domain. So we want to get rid of this integration here over a finite time slice. And that's what the LSZ reduction formula is going to allow us to do. Okay, so to get into that in a little bit of detail now, this is probably the most technical bit of the talk, so st stay with me here. What we're gonna do is, we're firstly gonna switch to momentum space with this uh, propagator. So I'm gonna take my background gravitational field, H, and I'm going to expand it on a basis of plane waves, where these plane waves are off shell. Then I'm going to take the uh, propagator, uh, that I showed you, the dress propagator, Fourier transform it to momentum space, throw in the spaces of plane waves, and finally multiply by the inverse propagators and cut them, as is required by the LSA reduction formula. And as time is short, unfortunately, I can't take you through all the steps here. However, I can show you the results of this calculation, and we go through this in great detail in our paper. The result is this uh, form factor, which is remarkably compact as it actually manages to describe an n-graviton emission from this scalar propagator. So just to give you a little bit of uh, context on what this thing actually means, um, let's say just for argument's sake, you take ca uh, capital N to be equal to one. In that case, this thing would just describe a single graviton emission from this scalar. So you'd basically just be looking at the expression for the graviton scalar scalar vertex. So that's where we end up with. So now we've spent a bit of time thinking about the QFT side of the story. Now it's time to hop over and start thinking a little bit more about the world line side of the story so that we can do a comparison. And so this is the point in the story where we introduce the world line QFT. Now the world line QFT is extremely similar to what Gregor has just been talking about in his talk, uh, the world line theory. But as he said, what we do is we promote the position of our black hole X to be a propagating degree of freedom. We also have to, of course, include these ghosts. So what we do is we go for a path integral representation where we have this partition function, which depends on the impact parameter and the velocity on our world line. And those go into our expansion for the trajectory of the black hole. So the trajectory of the black hole, our background is a straight line trajectory uh, parameterized by this impact parameter and velocity. And then we have some deflection Z, which uh, well, is the deflection from this straight line. And then to begin with, we make very few assumptions about this WQFT. We, uh, our, propagator for the, our propagators for the ghosts, I said they were non-propagating, so they're just described by delta functions. And our propagator for the deflection is just given, um, well, it has to satisfy the equation motion, basically. It has to be uh, time translation invariant. And then what we do is we take this expression here, we substitute in our background uh, H expansion, the same one as we had for the scalar dress propagator. And that, after several steps, which unfortunately I don't quite have time for right now, brings us to the main result, which is that we can make an identification between this world line QFT and the dressed scalar propagator. If you include this delta function here and this exponential, Q is simply the sum of the emitted momenta uh, the, some of the momenta and graviton momenta emitted along the world line. But there's a caveat though, and it's an important caveat. The identification only works if we take this specific form for the, uh, the world line propagator. That's going to be important later, so I'll come back to it. We also have to make an identification between the velocity uh, on this trajectory and the momenta of the incoming and outgoing scalar. So it has to be the average of the incoming and outgoing momenta which is identified with the velocity. And that's a little bit different from what people normally do. 
So let me now show you a practical example of how we can put uh, these different things into use. And I'm now going to talk a little bit about the iconal phase. So let me begin with a definition. Here's how I'm going to define the iconal phase. I'm going to define it in the classical limit, h bar goes to zero, and I'm going to start from a two to two S matrix. Then, uh, so that S matrix, of course, lives in the space of Q, where Q is the momentum transfer between my two scalars or black holes. And I do a Fourier transform and Fourier transform it into impact parameter space. My claim, based on everything that I've said so far, is that this iconal phase factor can be precisely identified with the free energy of the world line quantum field theory. Why can I make that claim? Well, I start from my 2 to 2 S matrix right here. I integrate out the scalars, as I showed you to begin with. And then uh, to get the S matrix, of course, I have to put the external legs on shell. And then I use one copy of this formula right here for each of the two scalars which gives rise to my delta functions and my e to the i q dot b. Finally, I have to sum over the momentum that's being exchanged between the two scalars. And that's what gives rise to this uh, integration uh, over q, uh, which is the momentum in between. So finally, then, this is our, free, our expression for the free energy in the world line quantum field theory. And it's just given by, um, well, so this is the, the full action of the world line quantum field theory. We have the bulk action, and we have the world line action, and also these ghosts. And so that basically is the link. And um, so for the remainder of my talk now, what I'm going to show you is how we can compute things on the world line QFT side of the theory, um, which will enable us to skip basically taking this classical h bar to zero limit, which is, uh, of course, the soft limit for many people. And what I'm going to show you is how that can be done by uh, basically writing down uh, a sum of vacuum diagrams, which it turns out are tree level. So in order to do that, of course, we're not going to want to work with uh, path integrals the whole time. We're going to want to work with Feynman rules. And we're going to want to work in Fourier space. Why do I say Fourier space and not momentum space? Well, it's because that depends. For the, uh, the metric, we expand it around the Minkowski vacuum, and we have HBU, our gravitational field. For the trajectory of the black hole, we expand it around the straight line trajectory, like I said before, and we have the deflection. And the deflection is the propagating field, which we're going to be, is going to interact with HB nu. Now, what makes this a little bit strange and a little bit unorthodox is that because the world line part of the action is not integrated over all of uh, uh, D4x, it's only integrated over proper time. What that means is that any vertex associated with this part of the action is not going to conserve momentum. It will only conserve energy, which of course sounds a little bit weird when I first say it. Now, as uh, Gregor said, uh, a very helpful way, uh, reason that you would want to write the action like this is because you only ever have linear couplings to the gravitons. So for instance, the most basic interaction we can have is just a source for the graviton. And as promised, um, this uh, interaction conserves energy. So in this case, the energy conserved is the momentum of the emitted graviton dotted with V, the velocity um, on this world line. And then, of course, we can uh, go up to higher points and we can describe interactions with these deflection modes, Z. Uh, and again, we conserve energy here, but this time uh, omega is the energy of this deflection and, and uh, k dot V plus omega has to equal zero. So this is a mixing term. And what's actually kind of cool about this is that because we only ever have a linear coupling to the graviton, it turns out to be not that difficult to write down an endpoint expression for the case where you have one graviton interacting with an arbitrary number of these deflection modes. And it's described uh, by this uh, rather compact formula, which I give right here. So obviously, at the, the, the orders in PM that we're dealing with, we don't need this expression entirely. But I'm going to come back to it later, because it'll be useful to help me uh, derive something related to the iconal. So I've now talked about the, uh, the vertices coming from this part of the action. I'm not going to talk about the bulk action, because you know the Feynman rules are just the ones that we're all used to. The world line propagator is interesting, though. And the reason it's interesting is because we have to pay particular attention to the i epsilon description. So to get the propagator, of course, is uh, not difficult to begin with. We simply look at the quadratic part of the world line action and invert it to get uh, 1 over omega squared, which is our propagator. What's really interesting, though, is how do we navigate around the pole at omega equals 0? 
because we have different choices. And what we've been learning as we've been working on this is that there's no right or wrong answer here. In some sense, they're all correct. You just need to think about what they mean in terms of the physics. So one choice is if we have omega plus i epsilon squared downstairs, that corresponds to a retarded propagator. And what you'll see is that in that case, this uh, integrated version of the propagator is only non-zero if tau one is greater than tau two. From a, a physical standpoint, what that means is that we identify the impact parameter and the velocity with the incoming states um, of our scattering. We could also look at an advanced propagator, flip the sign here. In that case, it would only be non-zero if tau one was less than tau two. And in that case, these variables would be identified with the outgoing states. But what's uh, very curious here is that earlier on in the talk, I told you that if we wanted to draw this connection with scattering amplitudes in QFT, we had to make a very special choice for this propagator. And I gave you the expression. It had to be precisely the mod of uh, the proper time interval. So now, now the game is we have to pick a prescription which allows us to match up with what I told you we needed. And so what we do simply is we take the average of the retarded and the advanced propagators, which allows us to cancel off this extra term here. And then our uh, parameters are identified uh, quite nicely with the intermediate state, the midpoint of the scattering right here. And that makes sense because I also said earlier that we needed the velocity to be identified with the average of the ingoing and the outgoing momenta. Um, and in, in practice, when you have different versions of these variables, it's not too difficult to hop between them. So for instance, if you have B defined on the incoming states versus B defined on the intermediate states, uh, theta is what I refer to as the scattering angle. It's been shown by many people that you can use formulae like this in order to interpolate between them. So now let's put these Feynman rules together and show you how we can actually do some calculations. So let's go back to the iconal. Uh, if we look at 1 p.m., simplest possible case, well, then we've only got a single diagram. And in that case, it's just uh, the two uh, world lines exchange and graviton. And what you can see now is how, I mean, obviously, this is a tree-level diagram. Um, without even needing to write down any loops, we end up with a, an integral of momentum. Um, because we've got a single delta function conserving energy goes at the one vertex, another delta function goes at the other vertex, and we integrate over Q for the momentum exchanged. And of course, we have a graviton propagator. And this is exactly what we would expect to get for the I kernel at this order. At subleading order 2 p.m., it gets a little bit more difficult, but it's still fairly straightforward. Um, so I emphasize that all four of these are tree level diagrams. So these dotted lines, they're just meant to represent the world line. And they're meant to differentiate vertices on the world line from vertices in the bulk. And so you've got four delta functions, one for each of these uh, vertices, and you integrate over momentum here, momentum there, and energy there. And uh, what you're left with then is, so the energy integral resolves itself uh, very trivially, and you're left then with two overall momentum integrals and uh, three delta functions, which is exactly what uh, Gregor told us about in his talk. You know, so we have the first two associated with Q, and this is what he would refer to as a one loop problem then. So we've got a delta K dot V2 left over. So hopefully the point I'm making here is that we have something very nice that's happened. The, the, the classical limit has in some sense been trivialized by the fact that we can now just work at tree level. Um, but we do still end up with integrals, the exact same integrals that we would get by any other method, not because we actually have loops, but because we have this mismatch between energy conservation and momentum conservation. And in this case, we can do the integrals, it's fairly straightforward to do, and we end up with an integrated result for the iconal phase up to 2 p.m. Again, gamma, which is v1 dot v2, is associated with the intermediate state, and b is also into, uh, is associated with the intermediate state. So I think I'm getting pretty close to the end of my time now, so I'll get close to wrapping up. This is my last main slide. Let's take a look at, so Gregor also in his talk looked at uh, the deflections. So within the context of our formalism, the deflections can be understood as uh, um, an expectation value in the world line QFT, of uh, the, de the deflection operator. where So basically, we have to draw diagrams where we have a single outgoing line, and then we cut that line. But of course, because it's just energy, cutting just means setting only equal to 0. Now, what you can probably tell almost immediately is that these five diagrams which I've drawn here are almost exactly the same as the five diagrams which I drew when I was talking about the iconal. So we ask ourselves then, is there a connection? Can we get from one to the other? And because I know the endpoint expression for the vertex, 
the answer is yes. It turns out that the n plus one point vertex, where you have n plus one of these emitted uh, deflection modes and a graviton, if you set one of the energies to zero, then that's given by a derivative of the endpoint vertex. We can prove that using the formula I showed you before. And so then what you can do is diagrammatically, you can work your way through the iconal, hitting it with a derivative with respect to B1 of the first black hole is going to pull out that outgoing line from each of these diagrams. You have to be a little bit careful. I mean, I, I'm sweeping some details under the rug here. You need to take care with symmetry factors and getting the combinatorics right. But ultimately, you're going to find that the uh, moment that the impulse is given by the derivative of the icona. But again, the, this expression for the impulse at this order is not the same as the one that Gregor gave earlier, because our gamma and our B are associated with the intermediate state of the scattering. Um, and that's the difference. But you can get from one version of these variables to the other. Um, and that's not too difficult. So, OK, so I can see I'm almost out of time now. So let me just summarize. So um, I think the main point was that we've now found this link between QFT scattering amplitudes and observables in the, QF, in the world line QFT. And we can compute in the world line QFT using path integrals with deflections and uh, gravitons. Uh, the Feynman rules on the world line only conserve energy. So what we get is in some sense, we have loop integrals, even though all the diagrams we're drawing down, uh, we're writing down a tree level. So besides the physical insight, we think that this offers a, a neat path to getting TM integrams. And we think that this sheds some light on the iconal phase for us. Um, and helps us connect with what people understand in amplitudes. Something I didn't have time to talk about, unfortunately, today was that we've also looked at radiation. So in that case, what you would do is on the amplitude side, you'd look at a five-point amplitude, you'd integrate out the scalars to get the expectation of a graviton. This is something that's also been talked about other people in the past. So next steps are, of course, to push to higher orders in the case of the iconal and the impulse. As Gregor mentioned, we're working with them on 4 p.m. And then we also want to think about the other sorts of effects, uh, spin, radiation, and finite size effects. Um, so that's it from me. Thanks very much. OK, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, Julio, go ahead. Hi, Gustav. Thanks for, for a nice talk. So I wanted to ask about this, this uh, in interpretation of the iconal phase. So in, yeah. in an appendix in one of the papers by uh, Raphael and Gregor, they showed that at one loop, it's easy to identify the iconal phase with basically this on-shell action. But starting at two loops, there's some things that don't quite work. So is this relation uh, that you have shown more general or or is it just that you have checked that one of it works and, and the honest you answer it work is we, The honest answer is I don't know yet. We are, work, we are working towards 3 p.m. right now. Um, so I can't give you a straight answer to that um, just yet. Um, however, what I, I mean, I think the real question here is whether the iconal phase is the exact same as the one that you get from an amplitude's point of view. Because I mean, what we do know for sure is that um, if we think about it as the free energy of the world line QFT, then we can get the deflection out of it. Um, I think that the, the potential um, for a breakdown at higher orders is, you know, if you have to think uh, in this formula about if there are going to be super classical terms or IR divergences or whatever, um, you know, that's something that we haven't looked at yet. From our point of view, the reason we write it as a phase is simply because we want the diagrams to exponentiate. Um, but it's a good question, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Maybe it's a good time to uh, say a little bit about uh, what you've done for radiation. Uh, for radiation? Yeah, you said in your final slide that you've also looked at radiation. Can you give a little bit of details? Yeah, I mean, so what we've done for radiation is we really just, sh uh, we mostly shed some light on this work by Andres Luna, uh, Isabel Nicholson, Donald O'Connell, and Chris White, where they basically show that you can, for the two-body uh, radiation, you can, uh, you can analyze it by thinking about a five-point amplitude. And I mean, the analysis for a five-point amplitude is really almost the same as it was for the four-point amplitude. What you do is you just go back to this time ordered correlator and just slot an external graviton in here. And then the argument runs through in exactly the same way. Um, the only difference now is that rather than being left with uh, the free energy, what you're left with now is the expectation value of the graviton, h mu nu. 
which is exactly the radiation that you're trying to calculate, basically. So, I mean, it, it really just reinforces what was done in this paper and sheds a bit more light on it. And using the technology, what we also did is we obtained uh, the free body radiation uh, integrand, which at leading order is uh, 3 p.m.